Okay, in this lecture, we're going to be discussing uh, inequality as related to the topic of gender and our discussion of the effects on life chances. Uh, and one of the things we should definitely talk about is the difference between, again, sometimes, unfortunately, these terms are used interchangeably, the idea of sex and gender. Um, and again, they are not uh, interchangeable. Uh, we are coming to a greater understanding of that in our society today. Uh, but again, the debates still wage on, right? Um, but sociologically, uh, we talk about this, and again, uh, shameless plug for other sociology classes, uh, in Sociology 203, Marriage and Family, we go into these uh, topics in, in very, very great detail. Um, but when we're talking about these two terms, again, sex, we typically use as uh, a measure of the biological distinctions between males and females and other, right? There are categories of, of, or there are individuals in our society who either portray both or neither of the biological distinctions of males and females. Um, worldwide, that population is about 2%, but in a nation, in a, in a world of over 7 billion people, uh, that's a significant number of individuals. So we could say that the, uh, sex is a measure of the biological distinctions, whether or not that's uh, genetically XXXY chromosomes, which again, we definitely know uh, from a further study of that, that sometimes even different distinctions, XXY, XYY. So, you know, there's, there's not just two categories, but for the most part, it's based on biological characteristics of males versus females. Okay? And that, uh, has to do with, again, uh, you know, uh, genetics, has to do with types of reproductive organs, it has to do with secondary sex characteristics that appear you know, after uh, sexual maturity or puberty. Okay, but those are all biological distinctions, which we refer to as sex. Okay. Um, gender, on the other hand, and once again, we're definitely seeing it in the, our modern culture uh, and as our culture continues to develop and um, discuss these issues, uh, much more of a, we can see where the distinctions between gender and sex were once very closely related. Okay, we even go back into the, you know, the 20th century, we can see, okay, uh, if we just think about gender as only masculine and feminine, and then we would say, okay, male, biological males are associated with masculinity and biological females are only associated with gender femininity, right? We can see where this distinction of, you know, only two genders comes in. Clearly in our society today, we are uh, examining much more what we call gender fluidity, this concept of gender not being just one or the other. But in either case, whether or not it was the quote unquote old method of thinking about it or the new methods of thinking about it or the continuing expanding uh, definitions of what gender is, we still realize that gender is much more of, as we talked about with race, a social construction, right? It's something we develop. It's something that we make up. It's based on our social characteristics of what it is to uh, appear to be, or, or uh, should say better yet, uh, ex expectations about how to behave uh, in relationship to again, socially constructed ideas of gender, okay? Um, again, society expects that boys and girls and males and females or men and women act differently, right? Uh, based on these concepts of gender, right? What it is to appear to be or try or expect expectations about how you're supposed to behave. Um, so again, just, you know, try not to and, you know, fall into that rabbit hole of, okay, sex equals gender, gender equals sex, okay? Uh, clearly, we want to make very different distinctions between those two topics and clearly recognize that gender is very much a social construction. Um, so having said that, how do these things that we talk about affect life chances? Well, we definitely know that for a very long time, uh, now I'll, I'll just mainly focus on our uh, American society, but that's not to say that you know, these, these issues don't exist all around the world. But we definitely know for a very long time in our society, uh, women 
were regarded as second class citizens, right? That, that did not have the right to vote, which is a uh, basically it was a denial of their full citizenship in our society. Um, we definitely know that for a very long time. Violence against women was uh, acceptable uh, and sometimes even normalized in our society. I don't know if anyone's ever heard the expression, the rule of thumb, right? So sometimes people will say it when they're showing people around a new workplace, oh, the rule of thumb around here. Um, and that's actually a, a pretty loaded term. Uh, it, it has its origins in the idea that um, in the uh, early uh, American history, Husbands were allowed to physically discipline or beat their wives as long as they didn't use any instrument that was larger or more you know, wide around than their thumb. So something like a switch or a belt, you know, that basically fit this, this distinction was okay, right, to, to use as a, as a weapon uh, of physical discipline. Uh, however, if you, you know, went way overboard and tried to use a bat or something like that, uh, you were violating the rule of thumb because that was too big. So it was kind of this idea of, you know, it was almost thought of as humane, right? Okay, well, let's limit, you know, to the degree to which husbands can physically discipline their wives by establishing this thing called the rule of thumb. Um, we definitely know that our society has had a long history of standards of sexual violence and sexual harassment. Uh, we can also point to, again, if we're looking at concrete examples of uh, ways that gender affects uh, people's ability to have life chances. We definitely know there's a gender wage gap. We hear about this quite a bit. Um, if we think about from the 1970s, uh, women made approximately 59%, 60% of men's wages. Uh, in 2012, that has gone up, but only to 77%. Uh, so even today in our, our you know, uh, the 21st century, um, just as a consequence, women get paid less money than men do for cases the same jobs um, and again that is a practice of discrimination right so when we talk about uh, prejudice or negative attitudes put into action that's discrimination so when we talk about these examples of things like violence or um, you know uh, different wage standards those are examples um, again in discrimination we'll also sometimes hear about business practices uh, which limit uh, uh, people identify as, as female or women's ability to progress in uh, organizations. So they're often called what we call the glass ceiling. This concept of, you know, in a, in a typical structure like a corporation, I'll just use that as an example, you know, it's pretty clear what the levels are in society. As a matter of fact, most, you know, large organizations actually have, you know, charts on their websites or, or you know, part of their manual that says, okay, here's our structure. We go from here to here to here to here to here all the way to the bottom. So that's the idea of glass, you know, these, these levels and where people are aspiring to get to in, this, in the organization are very transparent, right? But the organization puts stoppers in that idea of a ceiling. You can get so high in an organization, you can still see what's above you, but you've hit the glass ceiling, as it were. That's as high as you're gonna go in that organization. And again, a lot of times these things are related to this, this concept of gender. Um, we can definitely talk about kind of what we sometimes refer to as male corporate culture, uh, this idea in very large organizations, but in the sense we talk about businesses, we're usually talking about very large organizations like corporations. Um, sometimes it's also referred to colloquially as the good old boys network or the boys club this idea of how do people advance in large organizations are usually advanced by their superiors, the people who are immediately above them. So, you know, if you're looking to get a job, you know, or a raise or an advancement, a promotion, usually look to the person who's above you and try to make that person feel like you deserve that promotion, right? Um, well, and what we call male corporate culture is this idea of males are much more likely to promote other males, and they're already the ones in power. So it's a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy. Males look around and say, who's most like me? Who do I think can do the job? That guy right over there. And again, I'm using that term, that terminology very specifically. You know, that person's a lot like me, thinks like me, acts like me. I'm going to promote that person because, you know, the fact that I'm in the position where I'm in means I know what I'm doing, so I'm going to promote somebody else who's just like me. 
So this male corporate culture, this perpetuation of, again, these stereotypes that, you know, I know what I'm doing, so I'm going to promote somebody to like me. Um, we definitely know also that in our society, we are very likely to be socialized into specific general roles. Uh, again, if you remember back from intro to sociology, socialization is that process by which we gain the means of society, the ways of society, right? It usually occurs as well, it happens all through our entire lives. But when we talk about the most critical socialization that goes on in our lives, it's usually in our early childhoods, right? As soon as we become conscious and uh, learn to use language, then we're being socialized. And it even starts way before that, as many of you talked about in earlier discussion boards about hegemony, you know, kind of this concept of, you know, blue equals boys, pink equals girls, you know, this starts gender reveal parties even before the child's even born, right? This kind of concept of, okay, we're going to socialize you into understanding how you are, quote unquote, supposed to behave according to specific gender roles. So this idea of, you know, uh, you know uh, boys, you know, being active and uh, independent, right? Playing outside, playing sports, playing rough, playing dirty. Right? Whereas girls are expected to be more passive and dependent, playing inside where mommy can see you, you know, playing with dolls, playing games, playing dress up. You know? uh, so from a very early age, we're socialized into many of these gender roles. And of course, people who have experienced gender identity crisis, you know, sometimes realize, hey, I'm not conforming. I don't feel like I conform to these gender role socializations causes individual crisis and again our society is, is dealing with this big success um, but we talk about this idea of again uh, girls and women being socialized into more caregiver roles we'll talk about that in just a second too um, whereas boys again more aggressive independent dominant roles okay um, again, even when that plays out in the workplace, we can see this, you know, males, when, again, they're seeking promotion, tend to promote themselves, right? I did this, I did that. Whereas, uh, even as adults, women tend to be more socialized to look at the teamwork, right? My team did this, you know, I may have led them, but it was really the good work of all the people that I work with that, you know, achieve this and tend to share more of the quote unquote kind of glory uh, in these situations. Um, um, we can definitely talk about the idea of occupational segregation in our society, where we have definitely what we consider to be male and female jobs or roles in our society, right? And when it comes to different types of jobs, uh, again, there's a table in, in chapter three of your text that actually talks about, you know, jobs that are quote unquote done by males and jobs that are done by women and even when we see that similar jobs have similar characteristics they're often given different titles right so um, you know the idea of cleaning someone's house or apartment building or a, or, a, or a place of business you know to males it's often a janitor or a custodian for a female it's a maid you know this concept of it's still pretty much the same work but we give it different titles so that we can then you know agree okay Females are maids, males are janitors, right? And then we, and then that often results in uh, different pay scales for basically what amounts to very similar work. Um, again, from a critical constructionist point of view, how do we explain this? Well, if you're looking at it from a critical constructionist point of view, who benefits from this? And that would be the dominant group, which in our society is males. In every society around the world, uh, males are considered the dominant gender. So again, is that correct? I know a lot of people just heard me say that and they're very angry, uh, but that is you know, a sociological uh, fact, you know, that, that they're in societies, masculinity and male characteristics are more highly prized uh, than our female. You, know, you could say that shouldn't be the way it should be, and you would, of course, be making a, a rational case for that, uh, but again, that doesn't change the fact that that's the way it is um, by itself. Um, again, work done by males is much more highly prized in our society, which gives uh, to our very last point that we're going to make in this lecture, this idea of care work, right? What is care work in our society? 
Well, this is the work being done by people to take care of other people in our society. Um, largely, we talk about this in terms of um, children, right, in our society. So who takes care of children in our society? And largely the answer is uh, women in our society, much more likely to have to balance both career and family, where we sometimes give males much more of a quote-unquote pass on being able to focus solely on things like occupation and career uh, and uh, to a lesser degree family. Um, again, we definitely know that the gender wage gap exacerbates this issue, so it's much more likely that males who earn more money in a family situation are more likely then to spend more time outside of the home earning a higher wage or salary, leaving women to sometimes work either part-time or work at a job in which they get paid less, but then are expected to take on the additional uh, duties of home and, and family. Um, again, because biologically women are also the ones who give birth, then we talk about interruptions in careers and, and, uh, and occupations when it comes to the actual physical task of being pregnant and giving birth, right? Um, again, in our society, women tend to do a disproportional amount of housework. Um, usually it's about 18 hours a week. This is an average based on a lot of different studies of chores and about 14 hours a week in childcare, whereas men do about half of that in each of those categories, about nine hours a week in chores and seven hours a week in childcare. Now again, there's much more of a trend. You know, we sometimes see this among, you know, stay-at-home fathers uh, or, you know, um, you know, sometimes referred to as Mr. Mom, you know, that idea of, you know, uh, a husband staying home and taking care of more of this, but that's not a widespread trend. Um, again, the characteristics of home and child care is that it is critically important, not only to individual households, but as our society, but is not considered um, a lot of times, especially even when we do things like calculate things like, as we talked about in an earlier uh, lecture, GDP, you know, this idea of, you know, a lot of people in our society working very hard to do something which is not counted when we, when we kind of examine a society's uh, economic success. Okay, thank you.